Okay, let's begin. Um, 7.02 p.m. January 18, uh, 2022. Welcome to the regular board meeting of the Arlington Housing Authority. Um, so we do a roll call. Uh, Gar? Here. Nick? Here. Bella? Here. And Joanne? Here. Great. And we have Jack. Uh, Brian's on. We have Jack. We have Richard. Uh, our accountant and John, our attorney. So the first in the agenda is the executive director's report. Jack. It's not, in, it's not interim anymore. That's good. Yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yep. Hope you got yeah. those new business cards. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the town of Arlington is continuing to provide free testing on Mondays at town hall. Uh, they are also providing a booster clinic. The last uh, scheduled booster clinic this Thursday at Town Hall. Uh, residents have been notified by email and by uh, paper notice. Additionally, the Federal Department of Health and Human Services has announced an initiative that will provide each household four free at home COVID-19 test kits. Uh, we will distribute information about this to residents this week. I've also posted the link on our website. Uh, also, the Arlington Housing Authority was able to secure KN95 masks through MEMA uh, this past week and will be distributing them to residents. I would also like to extend our thanks again to Keys Drug for conducting a successful booster clinic last month and to the town of Arlington for the continued support and resources. At Winslow Towers, the AC project is underway. Uh, we are working with the contractor to minimize disruptions to the office and community room. At Chestnut Manor and Winslow Towers, the ADA bathroom project is, is also underway. At uh, Drake Village, the fire alarm system upgrade project at the Hauser building is currently out to bid. The creative placemaking project at Drake Village is in the design phase and the ar architect will be scheduling a meeting with the residents in the next month or so in order to engage the residents for feedback related to the project. Um, in regards to the window project at Monotomy Manor, um, I will be attending a CPA committee meeting this month as part of the presentation component of the CPA application for the window project. Additionally, I met with Race and Tilly from the town of Arlington to discuss the opera process and our request. Uh, we are hopeful to be able to enter into, into an agreement with the town related to opera funding in the next couple of months. Uh, we are also in the process of seeking out other funding sources for the window project, like high leverage asset preservation program funding, uh, also known as high lap, and that's through uh, DHCD. And, and part of that, that application process is being able to leverage additional funds. So this CPA money and ARPA money will potentially help us get um, a good sum of money through them, depending upon what they end up using as their calculation process. Um, annual rent redetermination packets for senior public housing. Residents were mailed out mid-December. Uh, residents will need to complete the packets and provide the required documentation by February 28th. We will plan to send out a reminder to residents in mid February, residents with questions related to the process should contact their property managers. We are continuing to submit share applications for residents. We have received over 35,000 in rental assistance for residents that have been approved so far. Uh, this program helps residents maintain their tenancy and address financial hardships related to COVID-19. Automatic Laundry replaced the laundry machines this past month. Staff in Automatic Laundry have been assisting residents get acclimated to the new machines. We received notification from HUD that we have been awarded $121,588 for our FSS coordinator grant, and that's the Family Self-Sufficiency uh, Coordinator Grant this year. This is a $49,588 increase from our award during 2021. Uh, due to this large increase in funding, we are currently looking into hiring a full-time FSS coordinator. Uh, also, pending the approval of the budget by the board and DHCD, we will be advertising for an assistant executive director position. This job is part of the reorganization. We will place the operations manager position. We're also looking into cleaning and landscaping contracts at Winslow Towers as part of a pilot program that will help support the maintenance team. That it, Jack? That's it. Anybody have any questions for Jack? I'm good. Uh, 
Okay, here. Um, okay, let's move on to item number four. 400 C budget as presented. Uh, how do you want to take this? Do we want Rich to chat about each one? Is that easier, Rich? Yeah, I'll probably just give you a general overview of the ball. How's that? Then you can All vote right. them it. Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, on page one of, the, of the, what we sent you out, this is this is what DHCD uses to calculate your budget for the state 400 program. Line one, the revenue would be from rental income, laundry, or, or miscellaneous income. Line two is what our non utility cost was last year at $2,904,791. The state is allowing a 4% increase this year, which increased your budget 116188 In section four of that page, you see that we have what fund centers were allowed to put into our budget. We have asked for an exemption of retirement and miraculous exemption time and assessment every July 1st. We've been asking been granted those all since 2002. So we get to increase our budget another 257,848. And then on line five, we would calculate what I, we think our utilities are gonna be a, a year from now. And then we come down to a loss of $616,000. $616, At this point, DHC will set aside the 616,547 in, in, the, in their operating subsidy budget. In addition to that, they're allowing all housing authorities um, to have stovetop fire arrest. I don't know if you know what those are. They're like the can of Sterno that you use in, to heat, heat a plate at, at a party that's underneath the um, hood vent. And there's a fire on the stove that they open up and then they put the stove fire Rich, out. Hold on just a sec. Could everybody mute themselves because there's some feedback with Rich here. We all mute ourselves and hope it'll go away. Go ahead, Rich. Okay, so yeah, they, they've had a lot of fires in the housing authorities. And then we have our DHCD resident services coordinator grant of $40,000, which we will be expending next year. So on our budget for 2022, we'll get an op operating subsidy budget amount of $688,092. Now, when we close the books, we redo this entire page and we, we put in on line one, the actual revenue we get and we put in the actual utilities and then the state calculates it. And then they give us a subsidy based on the actual income and uh, utilities. It could be higher, it could be lower, but that's just how they do it. And they've done it for uh, the last 40 years. So if we go over to page two, what we're trying to give you at this point is a look at each budget. The top section is the operating income that we expect for, for every program. As you can see on the 400 and the 689 program, we have shelter rents. That's the charges to the tenants. On the MRVP program and section eight program, we get an earned administrative fee based on how many units we have on the lease. So we figure out what that number is gonna be. Jack had already talked about the federal Ross. That's the grant that Jack just spoke about with 121,588 we get. On the local affordable housing, that's the rents that we bring in on that. And on modernization, when you do work, you're allowed to get some administrative money for the staff time that um, works on the modernization programs. So, and then we usually have interest that we calculate. We would have, you can see uh, antenna miscellaneous income. And there's our operating subsidy number we just talked about, the 688092. So you figure out the income for every single program. Now we come down to the non-utility section, which is a section that DHCD kind of controls. In our case, on the first column, on the very last line, the 3,350,272, we cannot exceed that number in those line items. We're limited on the administrative salaries in terms of a 4% increase. And we did the reorganization within the current salary that we have and the 4% increase. So we're not asking for any legal expense for our attorney. The member's comp compensation that you get is based on chapter 121B. You're allowed to have uh, 
compensation for the um, monotony manor rents that come in, actually the rents that are collected. Then we have travel and training expenses. You have accounting and audit fees and then our office expenses are just our general office expenses. We have some money for the tenants organization and line 4230 would be any Ross or FSS contracts that we have. And then we determine what our current labor costs are gonna be. The wages that we pay each person in the, in the maintenance department is determined by the Department of Labor and Workforce Development. They come out with that number every April 1st and, we're, and we, we try to estimate what that number is gonna be. So we've set aside 3% for that. Then we have what we think our materials and contract costs are based on historical um, amounts. The insurances, we know, we know what those insurances are gonna be during the year. The pilot, instead of paying property taxes, we pay a payment in lieu of taxes on the monotony manor units. And then we have our employee benefits, which is our retirement, our me current medical people and our, retirees medi our retiree medicals. And right now our employee benefits are running at 61% of payroll. And then we have some mobility administrative fees if under the Section 8 program, a tenant goes to another town, we have to pay them a mobility fee. So that's the non-utility piece that we As a DHCD wants, we determine the utilities for the 400 program. And that constitutes our total operating expenses for each budget. Now in the state program, 400 and 689, you always have to break even. So you see the net income deficit from operations. You break even on those. The state MRVP, we're gonna take a little bit out of the reserve. The Section 8 program, we're gonna add a little bit to the reserve. The local housing, local affordable housing, we're gonna take $7,000 out and more about 15,000. Now, as I said in the past, housing authorities are not like the towns. We get to keep any money that we save operating reserve. So the expenditures from the reserve in this section, th those are coming out from prior year's savings. Uh, and if we go to page four, you'll see exactly what we're spending those items on. So on page four on the top section, we normally have our extra buildings every single year. We're gonna spend about $211,000 out of the 400 program. We're expecting to pay 74,000 because they do not own any buildings. In the next section down, account number 4611, replacement of equipment not capitalized. We always are replacing kitchen appliances as need be. We're gonna do some lobby furniture upgrades. We always do computer upgrades and we're gonna buy a snowblower brush attachment for one of our pieces of equipment. We're not replacing any, any cars or trucks this year. And on the bottom where uh, Jack had talked about the air source heat pump uh, contract going on now in modernization. And under that one, the, that's gonna be paid by the 400 program through modernization, by the 689 program from the reserve and 87,570 from the section eight program. So if you come back to page three, the, all those expenditures will come out in the section of expenditures from reserves. So then we have to determine if we have enough reserves to do what we're gonna do. So our beginning reserves are our reserves at October 1st of 21. We have the above net income or deficit that we're gonna take, looks like we're taking something out of each reserve and what we estimate our reserve to be at the end. So in the 400 program, you can't go below 35%. We're at 36.11 which is close to with, if you go below 35, DHCD will tell you to make cuts in that expenditures from reserve section. 689 program, we have enough money to do pretty much any repairs we wanna do down there. And the other reserves, as long as you have money, there is no minimum reserve level. So Jack and I know that we have to keep an eye on the 400 program. We spent a lot of money in the last two years out of reserves and has drawn that down to almost of the minimum level. Hey, Richie, so, it's 36% of what? <clears throat> I can't. Of the total operating expenses above. Okay, yeah. Out of the 4.7 million? Is that what it is? You take half of that, and then they figure out 35% of that number. Okay. So, but I think we're okay next, uh, next year, meaning 2022, 
The only thing Jack and I know that we're going to have to keep an eye on the state 400 program. We're going to try to keep it right on budget and try not to, you know, expend stuff that we really don't think we can afford to expend this year. So, Mr. Chairman, if there are any questions, I'll gladly entertain them. Rich, uh, just confirm the time period of this budget. This goes till October 1st. October 9th, 30th, 22, yes. Yeah. So, in we're deal with, dealing with it this late because of the state? Because of the state, yes. The state was late coming out with, with their uh, budget amounts that they were going to increase. They didn't promote until almost the end of no, almost the end of October, middle of November. Then they were redoing their executive director's salary schedules. They were late getting that out, which still is not out. So all of, all of us just decided we're just going to put our budgets in. You're lucky Jack was hired, you know, and he's within the range of the current salary schedule. So DHCD said, yes, you could submit this budget without having to worry about doing a revision later on. That's good. Mm -hmm. Luck, luck of the Irish, huh? Yes. <laughs> So uh, any questions, um, Joanne, you have your hand up? Yes, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Right. Um, just at the very beginning, you said um, it was breaking up and there was a lot of, I think, static. So I, I want to make sure I get it right. Has the state has given a 4% increase overall to local housing authorities? A 4% increase, yes overall, not just a specific part. Okay, good. And just one small thing on, I'm sorry, I didn't get the page number. An account 4610, um, yep. there's an item 22-2 ADA compliance requests. What are those? Those would be if, if one of the residents asked for some special, um, uh, railing or uh, something like that to be put into a unit or something like that, that we would do that. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Rich, can you just elaborate on why is it so high, the benefit cost? You said 61%. Um, why is that? It, that? That is because when you have a re person who retires, the housing authority continues to pay their medical expenses until death. If you have a husband or wife and, and, and the husband dies, the wife would become a survivor for the medical insurance and, sh and she would continue to get med medical insurance. So you can have people getting medical insurance for 30 or 40 years. So really that number, when you, when you say a percentage of payroll, I mean, you normally would think, uh, if we have a mechanic at thirty dollars an hour, you know, sixty-one percent of his pay is not bad. So you're you're accounting everybody. I just want to make sure everybody knows that. So we're accounting everybody who has who has ever worked for us, who's retired and collecting benefits, and that's why that number is so high. Yes, you still have to pay it though. Right, you still got to pay it. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, we pay. I am an assessment to the town of almost six hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. For our active employees, we pay about three hundred twenty thousand dollars medical insurance. And for our retired, for about one hundred thousand. Yeah, it's big. It's big. Um, so, anybody have any? Uh, Gar. Hey, Rich. Is uh, the um, how how are these numbers compared to other housing authorities? For the employee benefits, everybody's starting to climb above the sixty percent level. Because remember, stories are relatively young. I mean, they really, a lot of them are only started in the late 60s, early 70s. You have in the, but a lot of them were, you know, later on. So they do not have a lot of retirees. And the retirement system that the state has is, is, a, is very generous to people. You don't see that in regular businesses anymore. You know, it's a defined benefit plan. So if you work a certain number of years, you know, you, you get whatever your percentage is as opposed to a defined contribution where every time you take money out, you're, you're a 
this, this when you die, it goes down a little bit to your wife and uh, house, and then and then it continues again until that person dies. You don't see okay. you, know, you don't see entities converting over to four hundred one or four hundred three b plans, do you? Public entities like this. Say that again. Do you see public entities like this converting over from a defined benefit to a four hundred one k or four hundred three b plan? They might do it if, if all the pension plans get fully funded. Right. They're trying to do that and they have to the year, I think 2035, 37, somewhere around there to try to get fully funded. And if they do that, I would expect that they would probably change over. The federal government has already changed over. They don't do this plan anymore. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, any other questions for Rich? I just have one more. How, how do the, our expenses look? Um, are there, is there any extraordinary expense up there that worries you? No. 400 program. I want to make sure we, 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 we stay above that 35%. And we contribute a lot to air conditioning, heat source pumps there. And then we contributed, I think, half a million dollars to the window. There. So that was a million dollars out of the room. Um, I don't think we can continue to do that anymore. Okay. And so in past years, we're way over that 35? Yes, we were. Yeah. We were probably close to 80%. Okay. Yeah. You start taking chunks out of 500,000, that goes down quickly. Yep. Uh, Thanks, last... Rich. Richie, what's the max? The, what's the max the state allows you to have? 80%? I thought it was 60. No. You there, Richie? 2.4 million. Yeah, but what's the, what's the max percentage that you could have in your reserve? 100%. Before you, if you go over 100%, you lose subsidy. They take money away? Okay. Yeah, they take money away, yeah. Okay. All right, I'm good. Okay. You need, you need a motion? You need a motion on each one. On each one? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> I move we approve the what was it the 400 400 dash one I, I move to approve the 400 dash one budget ending September 30 2022 Joanne second I think you're raising in all in favor Ga. yes Nick yes Fiorella yes Joanne Oh, you're on mute, Joanne. Yes. Great. Okay, that passes. That's number four, number five. We have a motion for number five. I make a motion to approve 689-1 budget ending 8, uh, 9-30-2022. I second that. So moved by Gar, second by Fiorella. Uh, favor, Gar? Yes. Nick? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. And Brian is a yes, uh, unanimous. Um, number six, appro um, approval for number six. Motion. I motion to approve of state MRVP budget as presented. We have a second. 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 So moved by Fiorella, second by Nick. Uh, all in favor, Ga? Yes. Nick? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. And Brian is a yes. Um, number seven. Do we have a motion for number seven? I, I make a motion for the approval of the federal Section 8 budget as presented. Second that. So that's moved by Joanne, second by Fiorella. Um, all in favor, Gar? Gar is yes. Nick? Yes. Uh, Fiorella? Yes. And Joanne? Yes. And Brian is a yes. Uh, number eight, do we have a motion for number eight? A motion to approve uh, federal Ross budget as presented. Second. Second. That was moved by Fiorella, second by Nick. All in favor, Ga? Yes. Nick? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. And Brian is a yes. Number nine, do we have a motion for number nine? I move to accept the local affordable housing budget ending September 30, 2022. 
I second it. So that's moved by Nick, second by Joanne. All in favor, guy. Charles, yes. Nick? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Oh, and Fiorella? Yes. Get that out of line. Uh, that's unanimous. And do we have a motion for number 10? Move to approve the state modernization budget as presented. I second that. So that's moved by Gar, second by Fiorella. Um, all in favor, Gar? Yes. Nick? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. And Joanne? Yes. And Brian is a yes. That moves us on to number 11. Um, Jack, you want to just uh, briefly? I know you need to buy a boat, but maybe you could describe number 11. So, so the reason why, you know, I'm asking for authorization for myself and Chris Patrick to get a credit card uh, to be used strictly for Arlington Housing Authority purchases is Bob Cronin and John Griffin had had credit cards in the past and it allowed them to make purchases uh, for different types of products, whether it be through Amazon, whether it be um, other types of entities that allow the maintenance staff to get the different types of supplies and services they need. It also provides us the ability to to pay uh, for different types of training and other types of services for the administrative staff. Um, some entities are willing to provide an invoice, uh, but others uh, do require a credit card. And this gives us that ability to do that. What's, the limit, on, what's the limit on the credit card, Jeff? <laughs> the same that that again. What's that? The limit on the credit card, Nick, uh, Jack? I didn't, I didn't even think about that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to get back. I, I can add it to, I can re-add this to the next board agenda. Uh, to get I, mean, to I, I don't think, you know, yeah, I, don't uh, think, yeah I, don't. I mean, I don't think it's a big deal. I think, uh, yeah. I think more importantly, we want to have a policy for the use of the credit card um, and stipulate what it's used for and have uh, yourself and Chris sign it so that um, it's outline strictly you know business use not to be used for personal or xyz and, and that sort of stuff uh, i had one i used uh, lifeline i can flip you if you no, no problem but uh, but let's just come up with a policy and have you guys sign it okay and um, and i can sign it as well probably and yeah and i would go for the highest limit as they say <laughs> that's right <laughs> oh. richie uh, might so be able to help with that really yeah, a question yeah, is there a policy that was in hand before? You know, how did this no. work beforehand? No. No, I just read the, um, um, the the handbook the other day. Finally, it hasn't been. Last issue was 2000, which we'll talk about at the next meeting because it's not on the agenda. But there's nothing in there about credit cards. It predates credit cards. And I think we're probably going to find that there was no policy in the past. Um, but so we'll just come up with one. Hey, John or Rich, is there a standard? state policy well one of the things if i may you can't use it for because uh, there are certain tax uh, uh advantages here that you don't have to pay state sales tax so if we use it for personal uh purchase uh, and we're avoiding the state sales tax that would be a violation of the, of the law or an ethics violation so got to make sure you don't buy anything personally with it because there is a, a waiver of state, of state sales tax on some of our purchases uh, but we've got because we will have a tax-free number so we've got to make sure we don't use it for personal purchases right absolutely and in fact why don't we do this why don't we uh when we come up with this policy jack let's just run it by john i forgot Sounds good. so so um would we um recommend a motion for this um under the stipulations that we design a policy and it's approved by the attorney i mean can we just see the policy first before Vote. Motion into a, approve this. Yeah, we, we could have just delays it another month, you know. To get the credit card. Right. Yeah, he wouldn't be able to apply for the credit card until the policy was done. I mean, um, like just say normally what happens it is the credit card should stay in the office. It's only used if you're going to Costco's to buy something specific, or you're buying it over the. Usually people get in trouble when it's in their wallet and they go to buy something at themselves at a store, you know, up the wrong place. And that can be an issue. So I usually tell them that credit stay in the store. 
So is there any is there any limit, Rich? Is there any limit on the credit card? No, usually no. There's usually just whatever the normal limit would be twenty twenty five thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the policy that I envisioned that I had, uh, very simply, it's got four points. You know, any expenditure must be uh, solely for the use of the United Housing Authority. Uh, nothing pers nothing should be purchased for you personally or anybody else personally. Um, you are required to present every receipt uh, for any purchase made. Um, and uh, any any uh, unauthorized use of the card will, will cause an immediate relocation. And if, if personal use of the card, uh, you'll be held personally liable for any expenditure made. I mean, that's that's the typical policy. Yes. Can we add to to get in the like monthly report just to like, I don't know, some sort of statement or any description of what the card is used for? Yeah, that's easy. Yeah, Jack, you could probably add the, the monthly credit card report in. I mean, yep. Uh, and, right. and with all the documents we get, you know, uh, but I think right. you're going to find it's typically, uh, you know, if they're going, if it's a car, I mean, I know the, the hardware stores, you've got accounts and things like that. This is typically a, a Costco's or, you know, now we're buying things on Amazon or the electrician might be buying a light or something like that. So it's, these are odd purchases, but uh, Rich, did you say, want to say something? Yeah. You cut out. Yeah. Of cash that's strictly that's for you can't go to the atm or the and pull yeah. out cash not yeah. be allowed yep yeah. yep yeah. hey brian yep yeah if uh i i have one for my work that i can find out find the agreement if you can't find yours but oh, perfect why don't you do that if you don't mind. you want to get it yeah do me a favor do that okay and uh is it something you can find while we continue our meeting no no it will take oh, me God. two days <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention. Joanne? Right. Yeah, I'm just wondering, Jack, is this, um, I don't know how frequently you need the card. Would it be a problem to wait until we saw the policy and then voted on it next time? Or do you have some need to use this right now? In the next I, I, don't, I don't see an immediate need. So I, I think that that, you know, I think that would be fair. Okay. All right. So if you're agreeable, then let's put it for next. We'll put it on the agenda for next meeting, and we'll fire off the policy. We'll send it out to everybody so you can check it before the meeting. Uh, so uh, it probably should also state what the maximum purchase should be for. You know, I mean, we buy in a ten thousand dollar item. You do that on credit card. I mean, uh, you know, it should go with that whole purchasing policy, but. But we'll send it out. So let's move on to the next uh, number twelve uh, approval agreement procedure. Jack, can you present that. I know it's yes. in the packet, but so we've been working on this grievance procedure. I had been working with John Greco. We sent it over to the state for a preliminary review. Um, I haven't received. You know, I've, I've followed up with the state to try to figure out where they are at with it, uh, but they're still in the process of reviewing it, or maybe they're backlogged with different things. So I thought. You know, rather than continuing to, to hold up the process, I'd, propose, I'd present it to the board so then we could officially um, submit it to the state for their approval. In, in, the, in the grievance procedure, it indicates all the, the methods in which residents have, have the means in which to, to appeal, uh, whether it be an eviction or, other, or a rent increase or something else that might be that they, they disagree with related to the process. Uh, it also also included with the grievance procedure is, is the neutral party um, as well as the resident representatives for the grievance panel. And I will be determining who, um, who would represent the, the Arlington Housing Authority as part of that, that panel. Some of the individuals that I've talked to already were, were uh, Jen McNabb, who currently is the director of management for the Medford Housing Authority and was, uh, used to be the operations manager here at the Arlington Housing Authority. Uh, additionally, I'm, I'm working, I had had a conversation with uh, Susan Cashel, who is the executive director over at the Winchester Housing Authority, and I'll be looking into some other uh, management um, at, at other housing authorities to potentially fill into that rotating uh, position as part of the panel. I read it. I thought it was pretty good. I would just do a, a word spelling check on that, Jack. Uh, yeah. Number four had uh, informal spelled incorrectly. Just yeah, I, I, 
but other than that, I thought it was pretty good. Anybody um, have any other comments on this? Do you, or concerns about this? All right. So. Um, Wait, so is this just, sorry, excuse me. Um, is this just to have like a, an outline on how we would go about it? Like, yeah. okay. Formal, a formal so, this process. Is, so this is the process for a resident, their, their rights in the process. Uh, okay. we're, we're required per um, the state regulation, which is 760 CMR 6.08, uh, to have this policy and, to have, and for that policy to be in accordance with those regulations. So in, in many ways, this, this grievance pr procedure mimics the language in there, yeah, um, but it is, it, it does provide the residents the opportunities if there is a, a 30 okay. notice for Proxy termination later. police or other instances where they, you know, would want that grievance. However, before it even gets to a grievance panel, we would do an, an informal hearing, which um, at, what, at which time I would meet with, with, the, with the parties to see if we can resolve the situation before it even has to get to the panel. And there's and there's um, different levels within this as far as how to elevate it if, if the parties are not happy with the decision. Uh, I believe it indicates that, you know, if, if they're unhappy with the grievance decision, they can elevate it to the board. And after that, they could potentially even elevate it to DHCD. So there's, um, there's a different, a number of different ways in which residents can, um, can pursue uh, grievance procedure. Right. But th this would be, so then this is going to be presented in the contract that has the, the lease amount for each tenant? I see what you're saying. And, and, um, and, and I can look into exactly how this would be disseminated to residents. Typically it's, it's referenced or, or it's provided, like if we were to provide a, um, a termination of lease, a 30 day notice to quit, uh, this the grievance procedure will be included with it uh, right. to ensure that, the, that, they, that they understand their rights. And then an informal hearing would also be scheduled with them um, as part of that eviction process. I believe that there's already, like as soon as you come into renting here, it already has a section within the contract that has a grievance, you know, how to report any grievance you may have. I was just wondering if this was going to if this was going to be part of that, or if these are just two separate things, I, I guess that was just it. Because if if mm -hmm. if this is for the purpose of tenants, I don't know how I would be able to take part. But I know that Mass Union on their website, I mean the Mass Un Massachusetts Union for the State um, Aided Tenants. Sorry, I butchered that. But they have just like a section a section within their website that is like easily understood but by any tenant so I was just wondering if tenants are going to be are going to be having this in contracts the possibility of making the language a little easier for them to understand but if this has nothing to even do with tenants it's just kind of like something between the board and DHCD for them to know that we have this in part then that would be two separate things so I guess that was my question. I, I understand what you're saying and, and I think that there could be a, a summarized version that could be you know provided to residents. I think that it does reference it in the lease. Um, and as far as us being able to edit the lease, we we, we don't have that authority. So the lease is a state a set template template from the state. So okay. any language in there we we wouldn't be able to um to to change. Okay. If I may, the lease does have references to it. And uh, also it, we can't get to court because the regulations also require it. So if we proceed without doing the uh, proper grievance procedures, it will nullify any court proceeding when we get that far down the road. So there are references to it in the lease and there's also references to the uh, DHCD grievance procedure. And then at that point, the grievance procedure becomes more specific. I would also put it online, Jack, put it on our website. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Joanne? Yeah. Um, sorry to belabor this, but I, I think the having it accessible to tenants is just very important. And especially in a, um, maybe not summarized, but a clarified way, this is step one, this is step two, and so forth. It isn't per se a legal document, but it's a how to make a grievance if you feel you need one. Um, and I, I think it should be available to every tenant. Um, they don't all 
go to the website. Um, it could be given with their um, with their rent increase or whatever other communication you have with them. And uh, I think it was just said, it's a state document, the lease itself, so it can't be part of that, but it could be included um, as a separate piece of writing. I think, it would you actually, could also... I think it would actually help everyone because if a tenant doesn't understand it, it starts the wrong process and everything gets confused and wrong, that's a problem for everyone involved in the grievance procedure. We'd like tenants to know exactly when they can make a grievance, how to do it, um, what, how to word it properly. Um, I think that's helpful for everyone. So uh, I hear you, and then two comments. So Jack, maybe we look at having this made into a um, uh, a pamphlet, you know, a, a threefold or some type of a pamphlet that you know you can stuff it in the envelope when you're mailing it out versus this printing it as like this document here. Uh, once you put in the date that it's been accepted. The the other comment is that if you read it, it, it is very specific. It's boilerplate from D DHCD, but it's very specific as the process and time. So. It's something that we don't determine. It's something that they determine. For instance, you know, things got to be mailed out within seven days, and um, other things within fourteen days. I mean, I mean, it's very, it's very detailed. You know, it's not in Chinese, unfortunately, but it's, um, it, it's very detailed. So maybe Jack, maybe we look at if we determine we need three different languages. Maybe we have them printed in some type of a flyer in three different languages. You know what I mean? Um, again. This only goes out when there's an issue. Are you want to be proactive and give it to every tenant now? Or what is your thought with this? Well, can I, sorry, can I jump in that? Yeah, go ahead. So that would be if there's a problem with the property manager and the tenant, but then when it's a tenant that has a grievance to report some sort of grievance to anyone, I think it should be, being, it should be available to any tenant as soon as possible because it's not only AHA that can follow the grievance steps, it's also the tenant that would be able to initiate that process. Yeah. yeah. So maybe uh, maybe we develop a, a process that we mail this out in January of every year, that you review it uh, for any changes and we we send it out every year, you know, to to each tenant. Because you know, as you see under under the first section, the overview and applicability and so forth. Uh, really a correct it's it's any type of a grievance so it's not just if you didn't pay your rent do we give you this so uh, there could be a grievance about anything so um although there is a lot of like you know you have to respond by seven to 14 days or something like that right right there, there actually aren't there's no specifications for certain times either so just i don't know just a random fact i guess to be able to tell someone, you know, hey, it's okay, you know, you haven't heard maybe for a couple of weeks, but it, it's been reviewed. There's no really any limitation that they have to, you know, they don't, they don't have to say, oh, well, we'll respond within seven to 14 days. If they do not, if they take longer than that, there's nothing that really says that they can't take, long, take longer than that. Mm. So um, I think we need to vote on it um, as there's really no substance changes that I'm hearing. Uh, it's just a matter of the distribution that I'm hearing. Is that so if that's the case, um, number 12. So can we entertain a motion uh, for number 12? So this, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So yeah, so this is just to a, the, to a point. Okay, sorry, I misunderstood that too. I didn't know it was just so Jack. So this would be for you 
to be able to give this to whoever's going to be representing that grievance. Okay. So Sorry. this is the, 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 our procedure. So there's two different types and John, uh, John, you know, interrupt if, if you need to provide additional clarity, uh, but the city allows housing authorities either have a hearing officer or grievance panel. Um, but yeah, I like think when, when we had met with the tenant associations, this was probably back in maybe August or July, or it was sometime in the summer and, and they determined that they would move for want to move forward with the grievance panel, which historically is the way that the Arlington Housing Authority did conduct their grievances was a panel rather than a hearing officer. So then we structured our grievance procedure um, around the grievance panel, uh, which was, and then we determined they, they agreed upon the neutral parties in that greeting and that meeting or who or where they would be coming from. And then I was able to get their, their signature um, indicating that they, that they do wanna move forward with those neutral parties as the representatives, as well as the representatives from their own developments. All right. So we're approving two things. We're approving the procedure that's written. We're approving uh, giving Jack the authorization to appoint the people to the grievance panel. Okay. I, I'm and is the um, it, the document is a DHCD sort of generated right. boilerplate? It's it's um it's based off the language in the regulation correctly. Right. Um, okay. I, I utilize grievance procedures from other housing authorities as my as my template. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm fine. I'm, I'll make a motion. Approve the grievance procedure and authorization for executive director to appoint appropriate AHA representatives to grievance panel for proper and efficient implementation of grievance panel. I second that. So we have a motion by Gar and, and second by Fiorella, all in favor, uh, Gar? Yes. Nick? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. And Brian is a yes. yes. Um, and then, uh, so the only comment really to that is the distribution. So Jack, you can work on that and figure out how to print, how to distribute it and that sort of, that sort of stuff. So that brings us to number 13, approval of space heater policy. Jack? So we were, we were looking into this even before some of the different disasters that have happened in, in other cities across the Northeast and in, in the Bronx and in Philadelphia um, related to some of the fires that they had. DHCD had put out some guidance within the last month or two um, indicating that we should really think about having a space heater policy. So we started to look into that. And, and but given the, um, the fire that happened in the Bronx, the fire that happened in Philadelphia, um, it's just even more important for us to have a policy that, you know, pro provides some different parameters around space heaters. And if, if an individual and if residents are provide the authorization to have it, you know, proper usage and, and, you know, safe usage so that we can ensure that our our residents remain safe. Hey, Jack, have we had any fires because of this? We, we have not, to my knowledge. Okay. The only, the only question I have is the very last line. <clears throat> Second violation of policy will force the AHA to take administrative actions, including but not limited to eviction. Probably should say um, take administrative actions up to and including eviction. Kind of reverse it the other way. I know, I know what you, I think, I know what you're meaning, but it just you don't yeah. limit it to eviction. You're you're allowing additional administrative measures and the potential of eviction. So maybe if you reverse that, yep. just one comment. No problem. There's uh, no way to like. I don't. Is there space heaters so you can just like put a timing to it so it shuts off after like three or four hours? And would there be a way to add that to this policy? Like maybe only purchase the ones that you can time or is that just kind of silly? Because it is, you know, obviously concerning if someone just kind of goes to bed or leaves the house and then throws a scarf or jacket or something. I don't know. Is there such a thing? Timed space heaters? No. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think they're danger. I mean, Joanne, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I think, as I remember reading the policy, that it had some exceptions in the sense that what if someone's heating unit is not working 
and I, I've forgotten exactly, maybe Jack can enlighten us, but that was an exception of what would happen if yeah, they had it says it. Yeah, it says it right there, uh, except yeah. extraordinary circumstances, and it details them there in the yeah. policy. But, so they do have, there is a potential that you could use one if you call AHA and, and you are under one of those situations. And I think that this just provides some additional information, uh, specific information. Actually, in the lease, there's already language about um, getting authorization for additional appliances in a unit. Uh, so in, in many ways, I think that this would fall into that, but this just provides some additional guidance and, um, and clarity related to it for this type of device. Go ahead. Well, I guess, I mean, I have not done a survey of all the units, but my sense is in those units is perceived to be drafty or something that people do have them. And I think that there should be some notice and a time period in which they should remove these heating elements before we move to things like evictions. I mean, it's just my guess. I, as I say, I haven't actually seen one. <laughs> but um, I don't know. What is your sense, Jack? That I think they're more widely used then this policy seems to suggest that someone just might do it once. And I think that we should then be sure that um, they're, everyone is notified and they're given a certain amount of time period to remove it or to make a case for an exception. Well, I think if you sent this policy out, you're going to have to distribute it, obviously, to each. Yeah. each and in your cover letter, you know, state that, Joanne, that, that, you know, if you do have a current device, you know, um, and you feel you, you can't without it, please contact us so we can discuss it. That's good. I think it, you know, it gives, and Jack, it gives you, you know, there may be a device out there that is super safe that we don't know of um, that, you know, discover it. It gives you the option to figure it out. So I, I would recommend we approve the policy with provision that the cover letter does state that it gives all the tenants an option to, uh, to bring forth and have our staff look at it and determine and then take it case by case basis. Yep. And also it might be that there's some draft coming from somewhere that some maintenance person could fix. And then there'd be no need for this for right. this here. And yeah, you can put that in the cover letter. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. put it in the cover letter. Yeah. Especially since it's what 22 degrees up there. Um, that's high, Brian. Yeah. Had a, <laughs> we had a cold wave down here. It was 75. Yeah. Well, you also had tornadoes. <laughs> I know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I haven't called you for two days. <laughs> I've been picking up the fruit in the ass. <laughs> so do we have a motion to approve number 13? I have a question. Yep. Uh, when you say the cover, is there, so there's going to be something on top of this piece of paper that we're seeing right here? Well, I, I'm, I'm suggesting instead of just mailing out the paper, you need to put a cover letter. Oh, so, okay. Well, hey, due to the... Due to the recent fires and other public housing housing buildings, you know, the board has initiated this policy. And therefore, if you currently have a, a device that you, you must need, please contact us immediately. So we can send the staff to meet with you and review the device and and and, um, and go from there. Because um, like I said, there may be a device out there that people have that is perfectly legitimate. And then Jack would come back to us and say, look, we found something that's legitimate that we want to, we can always amend this policy. Uh, we we I, can, because that, that was my concern. So if there is a failure of the heating system, it kind of just emphasizes that if well, just that, the heating system, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, it, when you read it, if you lose your heat, absolutely you can use the space heater. It's, it's got it in there. So, yeah, no, 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 I know. But I'm saying it doesn't only have to be in, in failure of the heating system. Like if they have really large drafts for whatever reason. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, as we mentioned. I'm, 
Yeah, and the cover letter should say that. But, you know, if you, second to this, if you have a unit that having issues with drafts and, and doors that won't close properly or windows that won't close properly, you know, speak up, call us, and we, you know, we can go down and, and uh, very simply put that um, uh, plastic wrap on the windows. You can seal windows. You can seal doors. A lot of things we can't do. Um, but people may not be speaking up, you know. So. Good. All right. So a motion for 13. So moved. Second. Second. So second. moved by Nick, second by Ga. All in favor, Ga? Yes. Nick? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Uh, Fiorella? Yes. And Brian is a yes. Uh, moves to number 14, uh, approval of the COVID-19 testing policy. Jack? So we're going to be, we're hoping to be able to implement this testing policy for our staff. Uh, we were able to get this template from the town of Arlington. So in many ways, we'll be mimicking the language that they already are usual, utilizing for uh, the town employees. Uh, this will ensure staff and resident safety and provide clear guidelines on uh, for residents that aren't vaccinated or, I mean, not residents, uh, staff members that are not vaccinated, or if we get to a point where we require boosters provides a way in which um, staff members who aren't boosted would be able to continue uh, working. Any questions on it? Joanne? Yes. <laughs> I didn't understand that. Um, I've been uh, watching all of this all day long, <laughs> uh, every day, because I have a daughter who's supposed to go to college and soon. But th the experts now say the booster is being fully vaccinated. It's no longer having just two vaccines six months ago. It's not being fully vaccinated. Um, so of course- the testing. Not, hmm? This is the testing policy for people that don't get vaccinated. Uh, it doesn't get vaccinated. They have to follow this testing policy. Yeah. Is it PCR testing, which is the most uh, valid testing or- is it just rapid testing? It would not be rapid testing. Um, well, the, the, the requirements for the testing is that it would have the, um, it, would be, it would be from a, an ent entity that would have their name and, and the results. So it wouldn't be, when oh, somebody would be able to just take a test at home and take a picture of it, um, they'd have to go to a site, whether it's um, a pharmacy, well, I don't know if pharmacies are doing, but whether it's an urgent care, whether it's the town of Arlington's uh, weekly uh, testing sites or, or, or t testing sites in their own towns. Okay, thank you. So do we have a motion for number 14? I move to approve a uh, staff COVID testing policy. A I second. second. So moved by Guy, second by Fiorella. Uh, all in favor, Ga? Yes. Nick? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. And Joanne? Yes. Brian is a yes. That moves us to 15. Uh, we put this on there uh, based on our emails flipping back and forth here. So 15 is discussion on commissioners' responsibilities and interaction with staff and tenants. And John Greco, please chime in uh, at any time with this. Um, Commissioners, you know, as you know, when you took the training, you know, the commissioners are either uh, elected or appointed. Uh, obviously, if you're elected, you know, you do answer to the voters to some extent and not just the tenants. Um, but so you really have a responsibility both sides there. Um, however, uh, it has been instances where some of the commissioners have been harassed or things have been said, incorrect things have been said about them. Okay. To the degree that you know, asked to put this on the, on the agenda. Um, my suggestion is, uh, and John, we'll get to you in a second. My suggestion is if there's ever an instance as a commissioner that you are harassed by um, a, um, a civilian who doesn't reside in any one of our housing developments and are not a tenant or, or some other person or official or even a tenant, uh, if you're harassed, to the degree where you are 
feeling um, that it's inappropriate um, and you're uncomfortable with it, that you immediately either call myself as chair or call Jack, or you feel free to call uh, John Greco, our attorney, for advice. Um, no commissioner should have to answer to anyone that is harassing them either by phone or email or text uh, or anything of that magnitude. Um, you know, we meet monthly. Um, our job is, is, as we do, we approve a bunch of things. We, we're here to make sure that the housing authority is run appropriately, legally, within the budgets, um, and, and that our tenants are safe. We provide a safe housing. We provide um, um, comfortable housing and that all our tenants are safe. Um, so, um, you know, again, my thought is that you immediately voice it to either Jack, myself, or directly to John Greco. John, can you chime in a little bit on that? Maybe some, some history or, or issues you've had in your, in your years with some other commissioners? Uh, yes, I, I think the important thing here is that public officials, of course, are, are uh, exempt from a lot of protections that other people are, uh, are protected with. But I think it depends to, the, to some extent on the district court judge, because there are cases that say there is a certain threshold beyond which people cannot go to uh, harass a public official. Um, so there are certain things, for example, if you look at what's happening in Boston where the new mayor, they're, they're yelling and screaming outside of her house uh, and they're disturbing other people at early morning hours. That doesn't even go to the level of the fact that she's the mayor, that goes to the fact that they're disturbing the peace at a particular hour. So that, that that could be stopped on that basis alone if they look at it that way alone. Now, if it's a direct threat to that commissioner and it's a, it's a direct attempt, then of course, a restraining order can be uh, achieved depending on who the district court judges because district court judges have a lot of a lot of power and they don't always make the right decision i've seen some wrong decisions uh, uh on this to be honest even with case law showing a little bit different but the question then is uh, do you want to take it on appeal and go up farther than that or does that stop it pretty much in its tracks there so those are the, those are the situations i think we have to consider but no commissioner um, every commissioner is really subject to uh, being a public official. The, the famous case is New York Times versus Sullivan, which is a case probably 20, 30 years old, and it's still good law. It, um, you can pretty much say anything you want a public official, unless it's shown with malice and with intentional knowledge of the falsehood, and the public official really is not protected. But other than that, there is some protection there. So that um, I think that there are things we can do, and that's what we would have to do. And hopefully we get a district court judge that recognizes that there are uh, limits to this. Not all district court judges do. To be honest with you, I would say the majority of district courts, judges, maybe 50, 60% of them, realize there's some protections that should be in place there and will enforce them. But there are a, a substantial number of district, district court judges who don't see it that way, unfortunately. Does anybody um, want to voice any thoughts or opinions? Joanne? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's an excellent um, suggestion that you made. Being under harassment, it's very helpful if you can report it to other people, even if the courts can't issue restraining orders. The fact that other people know that this is happening is important. Also, there is a personnel. All of us are volunteers <laughs> and the town of Arlington and probably the state has um, regulations about harassment of people who are in protected classes, which is a very large, <laughs> I think I'd do mine on age, <laughs> number of categories. But um, so I think reporting it to someone like the chair of the board right away is very important and then see where it goes from there. Um, but uh, keeping it to oneself, um, it just, um, causes the harasser, um, I would say they could, they, they can meet their objectives because it's very painful. <laughs> so anyway, that's my thought about that. I like the idea of reporting it to others. Anybody else? A great recommendation, Joanne. And I, be, I believe it's, it is the right thing to do. If anybody's getting harassed by anybody, they should report it yep. immediately to either the chair or to our attorney, yep. no matter what the situation is. So I think it's, it's fair and I think it's the right thing to do. Okay. 
So um, unless anybody has any other comments, all right, let's move on to number 16, uh, capital improvement plan revision, um, boiler replacement at Chestnut Manor, Jack. You're on mute. So about a year ago, there was a fire at Chestnut Manor um, and the fire prevention devices, the, they flooded out the boilers in the basement at Chestnut Manor. Our maintenance staff were able to work with the manufacturer to get one of the boilers up and running. And we've been fighting with the insurance company since that time. We finally got, into an, got to an agreement with the insurance company related to uh, partial payment uh, for the boiler. They won't replace the one we got to got to a working state, but they will replace the one that's completely unoperational. Um, so at this point, I'm looking to do a revision to our capital improvement plan so that we can fund that additional boiler and, and get, get this resolved so that we can ensure that the boilers are up and running over at Chestnut Manor. And do we need to vote for that? Yeah. yeah. What's the cost, Jack? What's the cost? Total cost is uh, $49,902. Wow. And, um, and the insurance company is going to give us 19,000, 900, 900 and some in, in change. Okay. And how long will it take to do? We're, we're hoping now that we're, we're moving through this and we get DHCD approval for the revision uh, that we'll be able to get the pro project done within, I mean, as soon as possible. We have, we've been able to get the, um, the, the waivers through the state for the procurement policy process and everything that we need to because it's an emergency. So we're, we're really hoping as soon as possible, whether it's with, within the next week's month, um, but it's, it's, I'm hoping, you know. It's, and do, it's we know do we know if the product is in, is it available? Yes, the product is available. So, so do we have a motion for number 16? So moved. That's written. Do we have a second? A second. So we have it moved by Nick, by Gar. All in favor, Gar? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Uh, Joanne? Yes. Nick? Yes. yes. Brian's a yes. Uh, it's a unanimous vote. Now we move to number 17. Uh, approval of the proposed change orders requests um, one, two for the air conditioning split system at Winslow Towers. Jack? So, as we've seen some of the other projects that we've been working with, there were some unforeseen conditions um, that required us to, to find a new route for them to work um, to uh, for some of the different work that they're going to need to install in the office. And so, they had to, to add some additional abatement and some other drilling and other types of patchwork and, and some of the other items that are indicated in here. Um, so in order to, to pay for that cost, that's what this, this, uh, this change yep. order is for. Self-explanatory, anybody have any questions? If not, do we have a motion? I have a motion to approve the proposed change order for the air conditioning split system project at Winslow Towers. Uh, do we have a second? I second. Oh, we also have. Go ahead, guys. Uh, so move Joanne by. Joanne. Yes. <laughs> so moved by Fiorella, second by Joanne. Um, roll call for number 17, Ga? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. And Nick? Yes. And Brian is a yes. We moved on number 18, approval of the certificate of final completion for the balcony resurfacing project at Chestnut Manor. So the, the project at, at Chestnut Manor um, has been completed. The architect has signed off on it. Um, we've, we've worked with our maintenance staff, with, uh, Chris Partridge and Roy Demers have, have looked at it and worked with them as well as the state. And it's been determined that it, it is time uh, to sign off on the certificate of final, final completion. Great. Um, do we have a motion for that? A motion to approve the certificate of final completion for the back balcony resurfacing project at Chestnut Manor. And a second. Second. So we move by Fiorella, second by Gar. Uh, all in favor, Gar? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Nick? Yes. And Brian's a yes. That moves on to number 19.
approval of certificate of final completion for the building exterior renovations at Drake Bridge. And this is the uh, the same thing just for the exterior renovations at the Drake Village cottages that um, took place, you know, primarily over the summer. Do we have a motion for this one? I move to approve uh, final completion for the exterior renovations at Drake Village. Okay. I second that. So we have moved by Gar and second by Fiorella. Uh, all in favor, Gar? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Um, Joanne? Yes. Nick? Yes. That moves to number 20. Um, approval of submission of sustainability grant from the for the energy efficient roof materials for the housing building. Yeah. And, and yeah, exactly how what you said, we'll be applying for uh, money to cover the cost of a white roof, uh, which will, you know, be in line with the sustainability grant funding through DHCD and also provide us a better product that will provide energy efficiency and, and you know, it'll, it, it'll be better for, um, as it be the, the right option for this project. So is that going to be the first one that we have for the Arlington Housing Authority? Like the first one in any of the properties? I, I believe so, um, to, my, to my knowledge. Is, is the one at, um, where's it being done again? At the house or building? Is, is that one of like the older roof buildings or? I think it's, it's one of the older roof buildings, but it's now in this time period where this funding is available uh, for some of these different types of um, initiatives that the state's trying to do. So this, you know, we, we have replaced other roofs, but you know, maybe that funding wasn't available at that time. So do any other questions on that? <clears throat> For um, number 20. I so move. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Fiorella. Sorry. I motion to approve the submission of sustainability grant from DHCD for energy efficient air source heat pumps. No, sorry. Um, roof material. Yeah, 20. The roof, roof replacement project <laughs> of the house or building. And second <laughs> by. Nick. I'll second what so she said the second time. <laughs> so we have it moved by Fiorella, second by Nick. All in favor, Ga? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Win. Yes. Nick? Uh, yes. And Brian is a yes. Now we move to number 21. Approval of submission of sustainability grant from DHCD for energy efficient air source heat pumps for Winslow Towers. So, so, um, I'm, so the reason for this sustainability grant application is I'm, I'm seeking out all the different means in which we can try to um, cover the cost for the AC project and not have to util utilize some of the funding that Rich had, uh, Rich Conlin had mentioned during his his portion tonight, where he indicated some of the funding was going to be coming from our um, our operating reserves and, and budget. So I'm seeking out all these different types of means in which I can try to, you know, either reduce or eliminate um, that need for some of that uh, some of that money. So I, I reached out to uh, Greg Abbey from DHCD, who who does the sustainability initiatives, and he indicated that the ES was heat pump component of this project would likely uh, be eligible. So I'm going to apply and hopefully get some funding uh, from them. Uh, we're also looking into some other options related to abatement, abatement um, and that, that hopefully will also help with reducing the cost. That's awesome. Great. That's great. That's great. Uh, great move. Sorry. Go ahead, Fiorella. I motion to approve the submission of sustainability grant from DHCD for energy efficient air source heat pumps for Winslow Towers AC project. I second it. Second. Oh, Joanne seconded. So we have a move by okay. Fiorella, second by Joanne. Uh, all in favor for number 21, Ga? Gars, yes. Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Nick? Yes. We move to the approval of the minutes, uh, number 22, approval of regular minute meetings of 12, 15, 21. Any questions, revisions? If none, do we have a motion to approve? I move to approve the 
regular meeting minutes of 12 15 2021. Do we have a second? I second that. So we have a motion by Nick, second by Fiorella um, for number 22. Um, all in favor, Gar? Yes. Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Nick? Yes. yes. Now we move to 23, approval of the special meeting, very special meeting for Jack Nagel uh, minutes on 12-22-2021. I motion to approve the special meeting minutes of 12 22 2021. I second. Second. So we have it moved by Fiorella, second by Gar. All in favor, Gar? Yes. Uh, Fiorella? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Nick? Yes. We go to number 24 appointments, LTOs. We do not have many people on the, on the, uh, on the call with us here tonight. Uh, I see um, Jen Hernandez is on the call. So let's go to Jen. Can you let Jen in? Um, and while we're waiting for Jen to join, uh, as per our policy, if any, any folks on the call uh, want to bring up anything, you've got to send us a chat. Uh, just hit the chat, give us your name, your address, and the subject matter you'd like to talk about um, while we're going through the LTO president. So, Jen, do you have anything to offer? I, I do. Thanks, Brian. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep, we got you now. <clears throat> all right, fantastic. Um, first, I want to just thank you guys for the um, gift cards for all of our residents um, at the holiday. That was very much appreciated by everyone. Um, and we'd be happy to work with um, the Housing uh, Authority Board to maybe come up with a how-to guide for the um, for the grievance process, if you guys would be willing to do that, just to maybe simplify it for the residents before um, sending it out, if you're open to that idea. It'd be great also to know uh, the languages, I think, um, yeah, we have, have a better that. idea on that too. Yeah, that sounds great, Fiorella. We have, we definitely have that information. Um, so um, that might make it easier for all the residents, elderly included, um, that we could pass out the same maybe same guide to the residents and um, it would just simplify the, the language and the verbiage and maybe the steps that they need to take. Um, a copy of that, Jen? What, what, Brian? Yes, I do. I do actually, okay. and I, I've already, nice. I looked over it um, re relatively quickly. I, I'm just getting over being ill, so um, yep. I'm a little behind, but um, yeah, I did look over it, look it over and it looked, it looked fine to me. Um, I will do so again, but I just think that maybe if we could just work together and get a guide for everybody, then we maybe would kind of have less questions coming in from all over the place. And maybe it'd be helpful. Yeah, maybe, to maybe, um, maybe you could work with Jack and, and typing up a, you know, like you said, a simple. Um, yeah, you know, kind of like of, a, just a little yeah. quick how to guide that, you know, simplifies right. everything. I mean, yeah. I would also include the, the, the verbiage the or the proper. Right. proper policy but just um yeah. and then we have the different a few different languages it doesn't have to be in too many um because we've kind of figured out mm -hmm. the languages that need um translations and the ones Good. that don't okay um yeah. so yeah i'm definitely happy to work with anyone on doing that um yep as far as the the masks um how they how did you guys plan on distributing them i don't know i was on another meeting as well as this one so i don't know if i missed the the distribution plan the, the initial plan right now, uh, Jen, is we're going to be um, packaging them into. Um, I, I'll have to check with with um, with Rolly again how how many he was going to do a smaller amount for the senior housing um, residents, and then a, maybe 10, 10 masks per household uh, for the for the family residents, and and we'd be putting them through the mail slots. Yeah. So we um we were lucky. We got um last month, Joanne. Um, was kind enough to work with Laura's sewing company and got us masks for the um, for our residents down here. And um, so what we did was um, we put we've stapled them together uh, per unit so that um, you know at least it would cover everybody in the unit that the children would get the children ones, the adult would get the adult ones, um, just to make it easier for distribution mm -hmm. you know, when we went around rather than have to pull one mask, you know, two masks, three masks per per unit as we were walking around. 
Um, so if you guys need any help with that or the distribution, we're more than happy to do that too, since we've already no. been there and done that. No, perfect. I'll, um, I'll touch base with Rolly tomorrow. Um, I didn't even think about the children's masks. So we'll see if we did end up getting allotted any from the state. And, you know, we may end up, you know, taking you up on that offer or at least working with you to figure out the best way to distribute. Yeah, it was pretty easy just, um, you know, stapling them together per household. And then we, we used a building map and put them together that way so that um, it was unit by unit and like separated by building. Perfect. So it, it actually worked pretty, pretty efficiently. It was pretty easy as far as distributing. Um, and then, um, so the four tests, four free tests um, that we had um, emailed out to all of our residents and um, the residents that we're aware of that don't get email, um, I'll go and speak with them personally. There's not too many of them, but, um, and help them sign up if they, you know, if they don't have online access or use email um, that I would go to the, those units and see if I could help them get the Great. masks sent to their houses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and I think, let me see. Um, if when you guys have a minute, if you, Jack, if you could send me the, the budgets and the stuff that was approved tonight, I'd appreciate that. Um, just so I could go through it. And um, so that we have it on file here for us. I, th I think typically, or, or last year at least, I'll talk with Rich and uh, John Greco, but I think we have to wait for the state yeah, yeah, yeah. to approve it. Um, yeah, that's fine. And then it, it just, just so, because they made it, might have revisions. So just to make sure that it is. Um, yeah, whenever, whenever it's feasible and whenever it's okay to send it perfect. to us, I'd appreciate that. Jack, didn't um, we put that on our website too? Yes, uh, last year. So we'll, we'll make sure to do that again as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, I would. And one other, uh, one other question um, about the landscape pilot. Um, that was for Winslow. Is that correct? That uh, we're, we're looking into, in, into starting with Winslow. I know it, last year we had been able to use um, for, for our spring cleanup and I think maybe one other time down at Minotomy Manor. So we're, we're very interested in considering that as well, or at least, you know, doing it in maybe once or twice a year uh, to, to provide the maintenance staff that, that type of additional assistance. Okay. Um, yeah, because the last, the last snowstorm, I mean, I know one of our maintenance guys was out, but um, we, I, it was, I felt so bad for Joe and, and um, he did a great job because he was a one man, pretty much a one man party. I mean, I know Rolly came down also and stuff with the truck, mm -hmm. but you know, we have a huge property and you guys know how spread out it is. I think maybe next time if, if somebody's out or even if somebody's not, if there's ever a guy that you could spare for even a couple hours to help down here. I mean, it's just so, everything's so spread out. And once they go through one time, I mean, it's, it's co either covered again or the ice is full, you know, frozen over and they have to go back through. And it's, it's really, it's a lot of work for them. So did we only, have, Jack, did we only have one person doing snow removal down there? On foot, I'd yeah. To, I'd have to check with the maintenance staff, with um, the director of maintenance. And, we did, yeah. we did because our other maintenance guy was out. He was out sick. Um, but I, and, but I do know that like Jen indicated, they would be sending another truck around for the plowing. In that at an autumn manor, there is a um, a bobcat set up with this big snow snow blower on it. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's just unfortunately James was out, so we only there was I no one else saw anybody but Joe, like on foot and on the. I think bobcat. in general we should have another person over here during snowstorms because it is kind of always James and Joe. I yeah, think in general, just like in general, with the amount of maintenance right. that goes on in this area we should have another person over here right i agree and like it was only joe this past time i didn't know that yeah wow. yeah. yeah chris Did so for everybody um uh, chris the partridge is online so he's hearing this so yeah great you can jack and figure this one out yeah it's a big place and there's a lot of work there so i think it makes do sense we have a foreman in this area by any chance is that joe or do we have no foreman over here because i know there's three foremen right is there's two foremen. There's two. Uh oh. I mean, Rolly was, I saw, I, I saw Rolly down here with the truck, um, mm -hmm. helping with the plots when he was here. So. Yeah, and, then, and you know what, why don't we bring this up, um, you, you bring it up, uh, Jen, as well as the other presidents, although we don't have anybody else on the line here, but um, bring it up. Okay, we can talk about it in the maintenance meeting next yeah, week. Yeah, def definitely. That's, mm -hmm. 
So. And, and, I, and I do appreciate the suggestions and, and you know, we'll take your feedback and I'll talk to Chris Potridge and Rui and, and look into it. But um, I do want to say that the maintenance staff did an excellent job of uh, keeping up with the snow at the last storm. And I have uh, no reason to think that, you know, they, they weren't able to, um, to, to complete the mission. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Anything else? No. Um, no, we can leave it at that for now. So I think the most important thing is you, you're going to work with Jack and, and, and do a little summary on this grievance. Um, yep, absolutely. In your own words, so that we can, whether Jack, we ultimately print it in a brochure format or something, um, and then determine what languages. Just for my curiosity, Jen, how many languages do, do you, uh, did you identify down there that um, um considered you know i have it i have it in my other phone to be honest with you i can email that to you because my other yeah. phone is in the other room e email but I have, to, yeah i yeah, definitely email, will email, email it to jack yeah definitely email it to jack and and you know, copy the whole board i mean i think we're all yeah. i'm just curious you know i know yeah, we, it's definitely Nepali. something I was, I was, what is it honey nepa uh there's 26 there's 26 maybe. last count there was 26 nepali units um and mm. yeah and that um they are definitely one of the, the um, languages that would be beneficial to being translated. Now, have you identified like a leader in all the groupings of languages? So for instance- Pretty much, yeah. Oh, good. And that person yep. speaks good English or interprets good English? Um, yeah, I found it's either um, that or some of the older children. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and so, so <clears throat> we, we've been talking as, as the tenant organization is, is utilizing the, the children, like the high school kids, yeah. um, you know, um, with maybe some of our memo distribution and whatnot. Um, and, you know, like you've asked, we identified definitely some people that could act as translators. So, yeah, that's great. I think, Jack, you might want to discuss that at length in the president's meeting because and come up with a master list uh, for you and the staff um, on who could these potential interpreters be if you had some emergent issue arise or some issue, you know? We, yeah. we have an interpreter service um, at the Housing Authority. Uh, our right, staff yeah. have access to that. So they, if a staff member does need to talk to a resident, they can call the, the interpreter service, which is available at all times. If we need documents interpreted, we have the service for that, um, as well as if we need documents translated, we can do that as well. And, and they actually provide service, so if we, did end up in a, in a hearing or some type of um, situation where we were having a meeting with a large number of residents, we could, yeah, if, the the need, if the need arise, we could have an interpreter on yeah. site. Yeah. Yeah, that's good, though. good, good. Yeah, it's, good, it's good here for us too, because we, yeah. you know, with, with the residents, because if we have to go speak to one of them, the, you know, just door to door or something, um, yeah. we bring one of the kids yeah. or one of the other residents. That's with good, us. excellent, excellent. All right, thank you, Jen. Oh, uh, ja I'm sorry, Brian, one more thing. Um, we yep. have an EIN number um, and we, who do I get that to, Jack? The, for the, um, and the, uh, do I hand, get that to Sandy? Bank, uh, banking and tax ID oh, number. Oh, the, the bank information? Yeah, talk, yeah. talk to Sandy Melanson. Okay, you got it. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other presidents on the line. Um, do you see any of the other presidents? I don't see anybody else on the line. Oh. Um, and I see one chair. Um, Jack, you could you could deal with that. It's about the security cameras. Did you see that? I did. Did you want me to? Um, uh, you know, just you could take care of, make sure they're on and so forth. That's all. That's what the comment is. Yeah, and I, I mean, I could, so it's, um, so uh, yeah, she, she mentioned that. We're in the process of upgrading the, the uh, security cameras down there. They have been, um, they, some of them have not, I don't want to get into the, into the intricacies yeah. of what works and what doesn't just for right. uh, security purposes, but it is something that we're addressing based off of um, uh -huh. some other that happen. Yeah. Good. All right. Seeing no other chats, uh, no other requests. Um, any, uh, the, the only last thing I want to say that we did not put on the agenda is just, uh, our thanks and appreciation to Rolly and the entire staff who helped distribute all the food um during the uh, christmas time um uh, it was i think i might have texted out pictures of i was up at drake um drake mariana drake coordinated a massive group of volunteers um there had to be 30 of them and uh, young high school students and parents 
it was a massive operation. It was kind of comical to watch and it went flawless. And so I would just offer our thanks to Roly and the entire staff. I don't mean to single out Roly, but, um, but the entire staff, uh, that was, it was a great, uh, great coordinated effect. Um, and Chris who coordinated the monotony manner. I mean, it's, it's, it's fast, it's furious. It was a little difficult this year because of the confusion in turning in the flyers. Some went to the boxes, some went to the presidents. And hopefully next year we can all have pies and we don't have to do it again. So let's hope for it. So was, any, it Dag, was it Dagostino's again, Brian? Yeah, it was, it was Dags. He did a great job. Yeah. Uh, he was, re, I mean, I had to email every single day up to December 24th because we had changes every single day. <laughs> Kind of comical, you know, between the blueberry and the apple pies and whatever yeah. meals were. Somebody didn't want sauce in the pasta. And I mean, Sam, he's going to heaven for all this stuff. It's kind of comical. But. Yeah, so thanks, well, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Sam. Yeah. But, uh, anybody have any other questions, thoughts? Okay, so we're going to wait um, um, for our credit card policy to come out. Guy, put out. We'll get it out and we'll bring it on next, next month's agenda. Also on next month's agenda, we'll put down uh, the updated policy and procedure book uh, that you all should take the time to read it. Uh, it's being modernized. Jack's working on a lot of these projects here now to modernize everything. It's, and he's just doing them one at a time here. So, um, all right. Other than that, um, stay warm, folks. We'll, we'll see you <laughs> soon. Can I actually say something before we go? If, if, there's any reason that the credit card would be needed before that? Can we do like an ex executive session for that? Or do we just have to wait until next month? Just in case. I mean, well, they'll do what they're doing. They'll, they, I, Jack, I assume you're putting it on your own credit card and we reimburse it. Or, or are you getting a check or what? Yeah, we'll, we'll be able to figure it out in the interim um, to, to a reimbursement process. But I, I mean, if there was an instance where like, like um, where we did need it, I mean, I could always talk to you, Brian, about it. A special meeting, but I don't. I don't foresee yeah, that. That's fine. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thank you, folks. We'll see you. Wait a minute. We need a motion to. to oh, adjourn. good point. Good point, <laughs> Nick. See that? I it's all that sun. It's, it's all the sun. That's Wait, are you? Where are you going? To, you go to the swimming pool. What are you doing? I, I, I don't want to lift the computer up and show you the. Pool. No, it's only eighty-eight. So. No, but, I, uh, move, I move to adjourn. I second. Okay, all, second, I feel all in favor, guy. Yeah, Joanne? Yes. Nick? Yeah. Yes. And Fiorella? Yes. Yes. All right. Thanks, folks. We'll talk to everybody. Stay warm. Stay safe. Bye.